if we do not know about the entirety of life, we live a very stunted life. And how else can we explain to other people about who our God truly is, all that he has done for us, all the abundance of life we can possibly have? Hello, welcome to the Simple Not Shallow podcast. My name is Charles, and this is the Coffee Side Chad series, so named because of this here cup of coffee sitting on the counter right beside me. And we're coming to you from the very hallowed halls of my kitchen university. Well, what better place to talk and laugh and learn than standing at the kitchen counter while drinking a beautiful cup of coffee? And in this episode, we're going to look at both the worst and the best parts of life of Christian faith. And we're going to do this through the lens of what it means to be a Christian, which, as you know, is to be a follower of Jesus that involves a relationship leading to studentship, leading to a life lived from everything learned. And I'll let you know this. It's only as we look at it through this lens that we can see that this that these two things are indeed the best and the worst aspects of life. All right, so let's start by looking at the best. I prefer to start looking at something that's more positive, don't you? Now, before we begin, I do want to let you know that I'm going to be referencing Scripture throughout, but rather than stopping and trying to add that while we're talking, I'm going to list it all in the description area. So you can check that out for yourself. And please feel free in the comment section to let me know any that I may have missed. All right. So what have I found to be the most uh, best part of life? Well, that, simply put, is to love. How is love the best? Well, for starters, without love, there would be no Christian faith. I mean, think about it. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. If there was no love... Jesus would have never come. And if Jesus never came, there would be no follower of a Christ, because there would have been no Christ. Indeed, we could even say that if it wasn't for love, God probably would not have made people to begin with. But that's a different topic, a different day. But as we consider love being the best, well, let's take a look at all it does for us, right? It provides strength. It provides peace. It provides joy. It provides abundance of living and life. It does not dishonor people. It trusts. It protects. It hopes. A lot of amazing things love does. Also, and this you may find interesting, we are told that it is as we love each other that this is how other people will know that Jesus is who he said he was. This is how people will come to know Jesus, as we love each other. Indeed, love is also the way that we remain connected with God and with Jesus, how we abide in him. That is all love now. This is all reflected in the two greatest commands ever given. Do you know what the two greatest commands are? Think about it. Of all the commands, the Ten Commandments, every other teaching of Jesus, what are the two greatest commands? Well, Jesus says they're to love God with our entire being, being, you know, heart, body, mind, soul, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In fact, he says this is so big that these two commands are the basis for every other command ever given. Every teaching in the Bible finds its foundation on these two commands, to love. Now, if that weren't big enough, you might be interested in knowing that this command to love each other, I have found at least 10 different instances, 10 different occurrences of this command in the New Testament. Yeah, I know. Now, what this tells me is that A, it's very important that we wrap our heads around this. We need to know that this is true. And it tells me that, rather unfortunately, we are prone to discount this, that we're prone to forget it altogether. 
the most important commands being forgotten. Well, the next thing I found, you may find to be quite a bender of your mind. It's going to warp your reality. It is this. We are told that if we do not love our neighbor, we do not even know God. Now let that sink in for just a second. If we do not love our neighbor as ourselves, we do not love God. We do not know God. Now, granted, that passage that we just talked about is telling us who a non-follower of Jesus is. And as we are considering this topic through the lens of what it means to be a Christian, you know, assuming that we are followers of Christ, how is this relevant to us? Well, I do find it very informative. For, well, if there has to be love for in a relationship with God to exist, then even a momentary stop in loving God, loving our neighbor as ourselves, is going to interrupt our relationship with God. It's going to stop it in its tracks. Don't you think? Well, I guess that means now it's time to shift our attention to the worst part of Christian life. Now, I know, I know, I know, I know. We would prefer not to focus on the worst part of things. I mean, if we focus on the positive side and that's all we do, we should be good, right? Well, I find that if we do not know about the entirety of life, we live a very stunted life. And how else can we explain to other people about who our God truly is, all that he has done for us, all the abundance of life we can possibly have? How can we do this if we don't understand this fully? I, I don't think we can. So, what is the worst part of life? Well, if we think about it, the worst is the opposite of the best, right? So the worst part of life must be the opposite of what we've learned is the best, which is love. So the worst part would be the choice to not love, to not love God, to not love our neighbor. And from life itself, we know that a choice to not love means that we're going to be selfish. We're going to be self-centered, self-focused, place all of our desires, wants, and needs above anything and everybody else. Right? And that does have a name. The Bible calls it sin. Yes, we're going to talk about sin. So, natural question, what is sin? Now, you may say, well, based on what we've just heard, it's the choice to not love and be selfish. Yes, that's correct. But let's dig a little deeper, shall we? Let's take a look at it through this lens and see if we can't see anything a little further, a little clearer. Now, here's what I mean. We're told that the baseline for every command in the Bible was those two greatest commands, to love. So if every teaching, every command, everything positive springs from those two commands, then the baseline for every sin we ever commit is to not love. Because it is the breaking of those first two foundational commands, no matter what it is. Isn't that intriguing? Now, here's something else that I found very, very, very intriguing. I did a little digging, and I found that the word that we translate as sin actually literally means to miss the mark. So the question becomes, what mark are we missing? Now, before we try to answer that, I wanted to do a little digging in the Bible to see what else I could find about sin, see what it would tell me. And then I would seek an answer. You know what I found out? I found that everything that does not come from faith is sin. Oh, and buckle up, because I found even more interesting stuff. Faith is not 
simply believing in God. Even the demons were told, believe that God is the one God, and they tremble. Scares them to death. So it's more than mere belief. What could it possibly be? Well, as I was reading through James, I found that love and faith must be connected. They're intrinsically linked. Now, granted, James never says love and faith are intrinsically linked. But as you read it, and, you know, read Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, you see they have to go together. Love and faith must be working together, or it is not Christian faith. It can be a, Christ, it can be a faith in almost anything, but it is not Christian faith. It is not how a true follower of Christ lives his life. Indeed, it is a breach of Christian faith. So, one of the marks that is missed is love. And part and parcel of that is where sin comes from. Do you know where sin comes from? The devil? No, not the devil. It may surprise you that Jesus actually tells us where sin comes from. It comes from within us. And James clarifies this a little bit. He says that it is as our, uh, we are tempted by our own evil desires, as they lure us and entice us, that is when we fall into sin. Our own evil desires, not Satan. And as we give in to the luring and the enticement of those, those become more important to us than God. Which leads to the second mark that is missed. And that is a relationship with God. I mean, when we give in to sin, we make that more important than our relationship with Him, and we turn away from Him in order to pursue our own desires. Well, we could say, right, that we have turned away from the one we love to embrace ourselves. And what do we call that? turning away from the one we love to embrace another. We call that cheating, do we not? No wonder God often refers to this as adultery. And I hate to say it, but this brings yet another mark that is missed to my mind. And I I can find no better way to say it than Oswald Chambers did many, many years ago. He said, temptation yielded to is lust deified. Lust deified. We have made our desires, our wants, God. Taking God, the one true God, out of the picture and replaced him with our desires. God calls that idolatry. But there's another term that could be aptly used. What do we call it when we rise up against a ruling authority to place our own desired ruler in place. And that's what we're doing. When we choose and reject God as God and King and place our desires, our wants, in His place as the governing authority of our lives, it's an insurrection. So cheating on the one we love all the while performing an insurrection. That is truly a great mark that is missed. It's missing the mark in its entirety. That is sin. That is why it is the worst part of a Christian's life. Well, there you go. There you have it. There it is. The best and the worst part of a Christian life. Now, I personally don't like leaving things on a negative note. I really don't. I have to know all about them, but I'd rather live on a positive one. So let me briefly mention a positive answer that God has given to us concerning this worst side of life, and I can do that in one word, Jesus. See, in one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible, John instructs us that he has written everything he has written for us, so that we may not sin. 
And yes, those are his words. We do have the option not to sin. That's a topic for a different day. But he says, if we do sin, we do have an advocate, Jesus. He is the one who makes it possible for God to forgive us and to pull us back into a relationship with him. See, God can forgive our moments of selfishness, our moments of insurrection, if we are truly sorry, turn back to him, and take steps to never be an insurrectionist again, to never be selfish again. He can and does help us to love more and more like himself, to be less and less selfish, you know, to help us truly be a servant of his in his service to other people. Ah, Jesus is an amazing Lord, Savior, friend, brother, and much, much more. Well, as always, please remember that this is just a brief chat. It just hits on the very tips and uh, highlights a few things. Much more could be said, but please take a moment and let me know what you think about all of this. Let me know what you agree with, what you disagree with, and please do me the honor of telling me why. Because conversations only start as we can engage in why we think way we, the way we do, right? And that way we can grow together in Christ and we can grow, grow together as friends even if we never truly agree with each other on minor things. Well, until next time, may your relationship with Christ grow. May you fully embrace the positive side of Christian life and fully avoid the negative. And may your coffee cup always overflow.